So thank you for joining us for the third in our SMT series um, this year, these, these forums. Um, and this one is about how does culture matter in mathematics, which has got lots of interesting and hopefully contentious things that we can talk about um, today. Um, I'm just going to introduce our uh, four participants and then um, ask them to each talk for about five minutes and then we're going to open it up to people's questions. So, um, starting with uh, Indigo in the lovely red scarf, um, Indigo is an associate professor in our department in CTL, and her research is situated at the intersection of two areas of study, the learning sciences and equity studies. And um, her, her work is focused on learning mathematics across a variety of contexts from both inside and outside schools and considers issues of power and identity in mathematics teaching and learning. And her current projects include a focus on mathematics and social justice, which is looking at communi community-based organizations that do social justice work and how they rely on mathematics in their work. And the second project's looking at analytic methods for digital media, um, uses for analyzing video data. Um, next, no, not next, jumping, <laughs> we have Doug. And in the moments when Doug McDougall um, is able to step away from being chair of CTL and a member of most of the committees at OISE and U of T, his research and field work focus on mathematics teaching and learning, the professional learning of teachers and technology-supported learning as well as academic leadership. And his work has been supported by various research grants and has had a lot of influence in the um, classroom teaching of mathematics in Ontario and elsewhere through publications from his um, largely classroom-based research and the teaching projects he's engaged in, particularly at the middle school level. And then going back again, in the blue, we have Bev Caswell. And Bev is the director of the Robertson Program for Inquiry-Based Teaching in Science and Mathematics at the Dr. Eric Jackman Institute of Child Study at U of T. And she's involved in current research with the Math for Young Children project, She's an associate member of, uh, of CUS for the Center of Urban Schooling here, and one of the founding coordinators of OISE's inner city option in the ITE program. She was the teacher liaison for the Inclusive Schools Project at Carlton Village P um, Public School and completed her doctoral research focusing on equity in mathematics. Boy, equity is getting obviously a, uh, uh, an extra boost today in perspectives. Well, that's right. <laughs> it's, <laughs> a closely knit group. Um, Bev has 10 years experience as an elementary school classroom teacher as well, and six years experience in the initial teacher education program here. And she was our 2010 recipient of OISE's Award for Excellence in Initial Teacher Education. And in a pale shade of, not pale, but a nice shade of turquoise green, we have Leslie, <laughs> Leslie Dukey. And Leslie is a third year PhD candidate from the Department of CTL. Mm -hmm. And she works under uh, Indigo's supervision, as well as with Tara Goldstein. And her research produced social psychology, mathematics education, and the learning sciences. And for her thesis, Leslie is exploring students' experience with collaborative group work in high school mathematics classrooms. And she's particularly interested in the role of social identity within these experiences. And um, she's going to be talking about cultural stereotypes and, and their involvement in mathematics learning. So a real variety here. And now I've forgotten the order we'd agreed to start. We've <laughs> okay, so I'll hand it over to Indigo. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm actually really excited about this panel and interested to hear what my fellow panelists have to say and interested to hear what you all have to say in the discussion afterwards. Um, I have a bit of an idea of what other people might say. So this topic is so broad, and I could talk for hours, and I'm going to focus on one I think, foundational piece and just define uh, a perspective on learning. Um, so all learning is cultural. So math learning is cultural. Should I stop there? Is that good? <laughs> um, so all learning is cultural. Learning to tie your shoes, learning to speak a language, learning to walk, learning to breathe. Um, if you don't believe me, you can think about uh, the way if you watch someone walking down the street, you can often tell something about them. Often you might have an idea of their gender. You might even think something about their race or class or know something more about them. Um, or think about breathing. Um, 
I breathe in a lot of different ways. I have, you know, I go to yoga class and I have a yoga, yoga breathing, meditation breath, um, the different kinds of breathing that you're supposed to do while exercising. Um, and so we learn how to do that. Um, so what do I mean by cultural? If I'm saying that all of these things are cultural, well, um, I'm thinking about culture as the ways that we participate in communities with other people to get things done together. So we learn through interaction with other people. So I'm not using culture as some kind of replacement word to mean race or ethnicity. Although I do think, and I think other people will talk about the ways that race and ethnicity have something to do with how we get to participate with other people. But I'm really talking about the things we do with other people. So learning is cultural, math learning is cultural. And I'd like to explain a little bit more with a metaphor. And I'm drawing here from the work of Charles Goodwin. He's a linguistic anthropologist at UCLA. And uh, in 1994, he published an article in American Anthropologist that is just such an interesting read and everyone should go read it. It's called Professional Vision. And he used the concept of professional vision as a way to explain the connection between learning and community. So professional vision is defined as socially organized ways of seeing and understanding. Um, and I'm, I'll also argue uh, socially organized ways of communicating about what you see and understand. So if you listen to what I'm saying, I'm saying even vision is cultural. If you look around this room, you don't just see some blobs of different colors and shapes. You see an audience and panel members. You see chairs, cameras, lights. Um, if some, someone else were to walk into this room, if a police officer were to walk into this room, or a, I don't know, a CIA agent, they might see potential security risks where we, we see it differently. Um, if I were to put up a mathematical graph for us to look at, again, we, we wouldn't necessarily just look at the colors and the shapes and see it as a beautiful design. Um, you could look at it that way, um, but we have been socialized in a particular way of seeing that graph as a mathematical statement. You draw on mathematical concepts to understand what it is and to communicate with each other. So things like act, the y-axis and x-axis. Um, the numbers mean something to you, and you use these concepts to communicate to other people about it. Um, and so Goodwin's insight was really looking at how our vision is schooled, how what we see and learn is always about the ways that other people have gotten stuff done together with us. Maybe that's doing math. And we've developed some ways to see similarly and to communicate about that. So... Um, so learning math is always cultural. It's a professional vision. It's a way of developing a professional sort of mathematical vision in ways that accord with what others see and how they understand it. Um, and the example that I gave of, uh, of a graph is a school-based example. Um, I do want to emphasize, I, I, do, I look at math in lots of different contexts, and I think there can be different um, professional visions associated with math in different contexts. So even if we just think about professional professions, um, like a geologist, an engineer, and a chemist, they might all look at the same phenomenon and see it mathematically, but differently. Um, so that's actually as far as I wanted to go. Um, I think others are going to talk about some interesting ways that you might think about classroom communities and other communities and how they interact, and I'm, I'm eager to talk about that with others as well. Um, but I hope if I've made my one main point, professional vision, then that will be something we can talk about later. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Can you pass yours to Leslie? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming tonight, or this afternoon, I guess. Um, I'm going to piggyback a lot off of, um, of what Indigo has said. Um, but so one of the overarching questions of the forum is, is mathematics cultural in some way, and if so, how? So I'm going to speak to this question specifically, and I'm going to draw from the areas of social psychology as well as sociocultural theories of learning to demonstrate the role of culture in mathematics learning specifically. Uh, so first, I think it's just important that I talk about where I'm coming from in terms of my understanding of learning, um, and it's very similar to what Indigo has already presented. Um, but learning from a sociocultural perspective is not something that purely occurs within the brain. Um, it's something that's shaped by the context. It's facilitated by our interactions with other people, as well as through our use of objects and materials that are available to us. 
Uh, so in a math classroom, for example, student interactions as well as their use of textbooks or calculators or uh, computers um, are all involved in the learning process. And these interactions and these objects are all produced and shaped um, as a result of culture. So when we take a step away from looking at learning as a purely inside the brain cognitive phenomenon, we can better appreciate the role of culture in math learning. Um, Classrooms are these microsystems that mirror our broader society. And the issues of power and the norms and the stereotypes that exist in broader society um, exist within classrooms. And so now I'm going to shift my focus a little bit and talk about how stereotypes specifically are um, involved and can be involved in mathematics learning. So stereotypes are a product of our culture and a product of society. Um, and many of them are long-standing, widely known, and, and deeply ingrained. And they're shaped and reshaped and perpetuated by cultural influences. Um, one example in the math domain specifically would be the negative stereotype that men are better at, at math than women. And this is a widely known stereotype, and it's been around for a really long time. Now, whether or not we believe this kind of stereotype to be true, research demonstrates that they can actually have a profound impact on our interactions with other people, on our performance on a task, and even on our learning. Uh, so Claude Steele and Joshua Aronson use the term stereotype threat to describe a phenomenon wherein the fear of confirming a self-relevant stereotype can actually impede one's performance on a task. So, for example, if a person who's from a stereotyped group is placed in a situation where that stereotype is salient and they're at risk of confirming it, the fear and anxiety and preoccupation associated with that can actually impede their performance on whatever it is that they're doing. And so what ends up happening is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so there's a number of studies that have been done to demonstrate stereotype threat. And I'll just share a couple of examples with you. Um, one was done uh, in a university setting, and uh, a group of women who are highly skilled at math were invited to come into a lab-type context to write a very difficult math test. Uh, but before writing this math test, one group of women um, watched these gender stereotypic television commercials, whereas another group of women just watched neutral commercials. And what the researchers found is that the women who watched these gender stereotypic commercials performed worse on the test afterwards than the other group of women. And so the researchers argued that watching these gender stereotypic commercials made gender stereotypes salient and triggered stereotype threat and then hindered their performance on the test. So studies like this have been replicated and they've, they've been done on a number of different stereotype groups addressing a, a number of different stereotypes. And the research demonstrates also that stereotype threat can be elicited in, in much more implicit and subtle ways. Um, so to give you another example, so again, drawing back to the women in math stereotype, uh, women, again, highly skilled at math, were invited to write a difficult math test, but this time within the context of small groups. And what the researchers found is that um, the mere presence of a male in this small group environment was enough to hinder the women's performance on the math test, such that as the number of men in the small group increased, there was a corresponding decrease in the performance of the women. And so, again, this kind of work, these, these patterns of findings have come up again and again and have been generalized to a number of different groups. And scholars use this work to, um, as a way to understand why we see, uh, for example, an underrepresentation of women and people of color within the field of math and even science as well. Um, the major critique of this work is that it's experimental in nature. A lot of the research is happening within highly controlled laboratory type contexts, um, but there is some work that is examining stereotype threat in more naturalistic contexts, including classrooms. Um, but this critique aside, I think that uh, stereotype threat research it provides one example of the fact that uh, students who are from stereotype groups are definitely um, dealing and contending with a lot more than just mathematics content when they're in math classrooms as a result of these hovering cultural stereotypes. And there certainly does seem to be a role uh, for culture in mathematics. Thank you. OK, thank you. I'm glad we're going against those gender stereotypes by having more women yeah. on this panel. <laughs> and we would have had Joan Moss if she was able to join us today as well. So. <laughs> And to another woman. Okay. <laughs> Off you go, Beth. Hi, everyone. I'm going to draw on the, some of the work that we did with the Inclusive Schools Project. 
And in one specific instance, when we used culturally relevant pedagogy to work with students and teachers to create a multicultural math night that was student-led at the school. And um, I just wanted to share that be because this was one way to that, that helped children get access to high levels of mathematics. So the entry point was culturally relevant math, but it led into rich discussions and rich mathematical thinking. So um, in the first meetings with the teachers at Flemington, uh, three, they had three goals for the event, to create a math night that honored cultural contributions to mathematics, to create a math night that was run by the students, and to prepare students for the math night by creating inquiry-based lessons that would help them um, learn about number systems and mathematical contributions from non-Western thinkers, and that would reflect some of the cultural and linguistic knowledge that the children brought to the school. So we wanted the, t the students to be empowered to see math more than just activities that are done in a textbook, but as cultural, a cultural tool that people use to help understand and make sense of the world. And as Rochelle Gutierrez so aptly puts it, for most math educators, identity issues might include understanding mathematics as a cultural practice that might further develop the appreciation of one's roots. So how, I just wanted to explain a little bit how it, how it played out. In the weeks before the event took place, we visited various grade four and five classrooms, introducing students to some of these ideas. So students um, studied the Yoruba number system from West Africa, which is an elaborate base 20 system. They learnt about Al-Khwarizmi, a Muslim mathematician and astronomer who introduced Hindu Arabic numerals and concepts of algebra to European mathematicians over a thousand years ago. And they made, uh, they studied the Japanese soroban and made their own popsicle stick abacus and learned how to perform calculations on this tool. And they learned about Hypatia, a mathematician from Egypt. And the students, right away we, we noticed that students seemed honored to learn about these significant contributions and um, from people representing their own cultural background. And then this in turn provided motivation for them to learn more about um, math concepts and historical contexts. So in one example, they, we, they were introduced to Muhammad Yunus, who was a Bangladeshi economist, who was the founder of the Grameen Bank, which is a micro lending, micro credit organization to provide loans for people that cannot ordinarily get um, collateral. So in the Grameen Bank activities, um, we created a game, we created skits about collateral with the children and created a game using, it, using an example from a book called Basket, A Basket Full of Bangles, which um, talks about a woman from Bangladesh who received a 2000 Taka loan. Taka is the bang Bangladesh currency. And this, um, this was just one example of how a culturally relevant aspect seemed to propel the students into thinking more deeply about the math. So throughout the game, the, the students were cre clearly, they could articulate how an interest rate of 20% on 2,000 taka would translate into repaying an extra 400 taka on the 2,000 taka loan. They could skillfully count money, provide change for others, and we also began to see how culturally relevant pedagogy could build on students' lived experiences. So for example, the children were fascinated by this taka, the Bangladeshi currency. And that uh, sparked their interest in cur currency from their own countries and from other countries. So we had comments such as the following. In my country, Ghana, we have the Ghana Sadi. Where my family is from, Ethiopia, we have the Burr. In Jamaica, we have the Jamaican dollar. In Somalia, we have the Somali shilling. So next steps in curriculum design included having children examine currency and exchange rates from, other, um, from around the world, and also building on the financial literacy that they are already bringing to school. This is just but one example. Um, students also demonstrated interest in developing Fin further financial literacy skills. So at the end of the game, when the children counted their profit and um, realized what they'd have to pay back, they, um, we asked them what they would do with their profit. And many said, oh, we would reinvest it in our business, or we would rent space in the mall to sell products. Um, and they also developed vocabulary around financial literacy. But they also, 
the activity sparked their interest in areas outside of the math curriculum, but that then rolled back to math. For example, they were interested to know where Bangladesh was located. And we were able to project a map right away on a smart board um, showing the location of Bangladesh. This then prompted children to ask what the population would be Bangl of Bangladesh. And it's 150 million, approximately. We wrote the number on the blackboard and then had a side lesson on reading large numbers and place value. And then this led um, to children uh, making comments about the fact that 150 million people are living in such a small space. And then they said, what would the population of Canada be? We showed 34 million. And then they said, wow, look at the, you know, they compared the land area. And so what they were getting at were big ideas of population density. And so from this culturally relevant activity, you could see that um, students were, you know, designing their own curriculum and moving forward. And also during, during the math night when these activities were presented, many of the parents were interested in this idea of microfinance and asked if there were possibilities of this in Toronto or in Canada. And we were able to work with the school and local community, community organizations here in Toronto um, to provide a microfinance session for the parents there. And so this project tried to honor some cultural contributions in math, but what ended up happening is that it was becoming a community building um, project with, you know, and the, the attendance at the math night, by the way, this multicultural math night, it was standing room only. The school had never seen so many parents come, and I think because children were running it, it was honoring cultural contributions, and um, anyway, so that's one example. I also hope at some point in our discussion to talk about another example where it's a, a huge focus on math content provided a, a, a springboard for us to look at um, or for children's cultural and linguistic knowledge to be revealed. So hopefully I get a chance for that. So I'm going to end now. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Bev. And on to Doug. Okay. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, I, as I started to think about this, I thought I should go back to me as an early teacher. And I was in the classroom, and I felt I had to convince my students the value of mathematics. And I did it with, I had the big button that says, I love mathematics. And I had pens, I love mathematics. I was going to find a way to make it valuable in their lives. And then I would hear from parents and they would say, I can't do math. As if it was an explanation of why their child couldn't do math. And that nobody in their whole family tree could do math. So, of course, why would their child be able to do it? And I started to think more that maybe thinking about culture is really two parts, and we've heard both of them here, and I'm just going to mention them again. One is that mathematics itself as a culture, and then the role of culture in mathematics. And I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes on both of each of those. So the, I started to think a little bit about the view of mathematics was something that we learned that in order to do mathematics, you had to know the culture of mathematics. You had to know the norms, the, the algorithms, the skills that were there, and then you could become part of the community of math students. And if you were unsuccessful one day, then you didn't feel like you wanted to really do much homework. And then you didn't figure out the new norms of the culture the second day and the third day. Before you know it, you felt you were outside of that culture. And that those who were inside were successful and those who were outside were not. And it was almost like we, we created this community, but we forgot to tell the students that they had to be part of this community and how to get in and how to get out. And so as I started to think about a culture, what are we trying to create as a set of norms within that community, then I would see that we want to have a view that all students could be successful, that we wanted to uh, find ways to ensure that uh, maybe if students were asked questions and the, the posed in a certain way that got them to think in different ways and give them a chance to share their ideas with somebody else, that cooperative learning, for example, is a cultural norm in that classroom. So that when students enter the classroom, they feel like there's a safety net. Really, the kinds of things that we would put in place for a culture or a society that we want to be successful. And while I think a little bit more about that, I think that we want to really have st students who feel that they're a part of this engaging citizen of this new culture, which is about mathematics and different ways of entering it. And I know that a lot of my research and a number of other uh, research is about how do we help students feel a part of that culture. 
and what are some of the things that they've done. So I've been to Cuba and um, Greece, China, taking a look at maybe a little bit about what are their culture norms? What do they expect? So in some classrooms in those countries, the cultural norm is that the students are quiet. They sit there, the teacher knows everything, and the students are quietly listening or learning in a sense. But we actually know that talking is not teaching and listening is not learning. So the fact that somebody is talking doesn't mean that we're really teaching anything. It's just we hear voices. And that we're listening doesn't mean we're learning until we make a connection. And it's through that interaction between the characters and the people within that community is what creates that culture. The second half of it is really the role of culture in mathematics, which is that out, outside of the classroom exists a series, a variety of cultures. And those cultures are then brought to the math classroom and they've brought different worldviews, for example, of what we might look at. So a lot of research has been done in taking a look at uh, rice farmers, uh, grocery stores, um, students, uh, children on streets, um, for example, where we're trying to get an idea of what students do in their own world as compared to what they do in the classroom. What do they do in their culture? For example, we've read uh, things about uh, street vendors and how they're able to interact with mathematics, which is different than what the students can do in the classroom. So we've learned along the way that maybe one of the best ways to do that is to bring in these uh, cultural examples into the classroom so that the students start to feel a connection to their past experiences, and particularly their parents when they take the work home. And so um, thinking a little bit more about culture, if we take a look at international math contests, for example, or math uh, tests, we realize that uh, from TIMS or PISA, a lot of those kinds of tests give us some information about culture. For example, if we look at the top performing countries, they're almost all Asian countries. So when we start to think of what, how they value mathematics and the fact that to be successful means that you are successful in mathematics is quite a bit different than what we might see in my hometown of Peterborough where parents would say, I'm just trying to learn enough math so I can get finished with school. I'm not really interested in doing more. Again, because my family tree didn't have mathematics and didn't know how to do it. So the, um, maybe the ways to start to think about it is how can we start to understand the worldview of other countries, of other students, of other citizens in our math classroom so that we get a better sense of how to work with them so that they can feel that their culture contributes to our understanding of mathematics. And uh, I just finished a course in Aboriginal Worldview online. There were 28,000 of us taking this course. And I learned a lot about how different cultures, particularly in this culture, think about learning and that learning is embedded in stories and that the stories are told over and over again until finally they're ready to learn the story. Now, if I'm a teacher in a classroom and I didn't know that, I'm not going to be able to value or understand the role of that culture in my classroom. Now that I do understand that, I see that I need to, to continue using the ideas they've built in their original worldview, which is a medicine wheel. Everything is in a circle. So if I can link my teaching to a circle, I've now reached those students. So part of my story I told you at the very beginning, which is where, where my push to try to excite students about the value of mathematics, I now have a better sense. I have to do more than that. I have to bring in other cultures, maybe through games, so that the students can link to the games they understand with what I'm trying to do. And I think that's part of, I see many of us from different cultures and backgrounds and how we value mathematics. And I look forward perhaps to hearing some of your experiences as children and how you've changed or how you've embedded cultural view or how culture matters in your mathematics classroom. Okay, thank you very much. Has anybody got a burning question they want to start? Uh, sort of question slash comment on uh, what Doug was uh, talking about is uh, I grew up in um, Bangladesh in the 80s and the 90s and I sort of transferred halfway to North America, halfway through my education. And I remember doing math in Bangladesh growing up and we just did insane amounts of drills. We just did lots and lots of drills till we, we really got it down. And why did we do drills? We just, you just had to do it. You just have to pass a test. You have to do your O-levels, O-levels or A-levels or SAT or whatever if you want to go somewhere else. 
So when I sort of started college here, I noticed that I was actually ahead of a lot of my colleagues who had, you know, had gone through an American or a Canadian school system. And what I noticed was that there was a lot more focus in North America on really the deeper aspects of mathematics, like really understanding, really, okay, really understanding mathematics, which wasn't necessarily present in Bangladesh while I was, um, I was growing up. And it seemed to me like, it's like learning to drive a car and learning to drive a car and be a mechanic. So does, you know, the, so my question is, does everyone need to be a mechanic? Can math just be a way to get from point A to point B? So, yeah, good so question. I, Who wants to tackle that? Um, so I think there are many, many ways to learn and use and do math. And actually, probably many of us do a lot of different kinds of maths in different contexts. I think your question is not so much about math as it is about what school is for and what school is about, what we're trying to produce or reproduce um, in our citizenry. And so I have lots of opinions about that, but I think that that question is one that um, we're probably never all going to agree on. And that's like a site of major conflict within schools. Um, is what are we actually trying to do? Are we trying to get people to make a computation? Or are we trying to be able to get people to um, reinvent from the beginning what mathematics was? I think uh, there's sort of seems to be, I'll call it a growing consensus, but there's still a lot of conflict around sort of math for a knowledge society. Right. And currently, I think there is much more of much more backing to the idea that. Um, Students could find the answer to a math fact or find a formula or any of us could do that mm, with more or less ease. But uh, knowledge is constantly being created at, at a huge rate and we need to be able to, um, to move with it and to invent things as we go. And so I think that this idea of being a mechanic versus um, driving a car, yeah. um, that there is more emphasis on, on being a mechanic and understanding how things work so that you can build the next generation of cars. Right. Hi, and I also think that in, um, in good teaching, in good math classrooms, you can do, because you're talking about conceptual understanding and right. procedural fluency, yeah. and I think that you need both to yeah. become a you know, fully informed citizen, and that there's, um, we've had ex examples of how you can do that. Like we've, if Joan was here, I, you know, we could use her example, I'll use it anyway. Yeah, yeah. How she, in uh, a patterning activity, she introduces children to patterning and algebraic notions by having this function machine. It's an input-output machine. Yeah. You put a number in and a robot at the back or a teacher or another student um, puts from an output slot another number. So maybe the input number is three, the output number is nine. Input number is five, output number is 15. And so kids start to see this pattern that it's, what's the pattern? What's the rule? What is it? Times three. Times three, thank you. Okay. And um, so they're starting to, and then you can, you can do one times three plus one. Anyway, the kids get really excited about this. And what I found with children who, or actually they were older students, grade seven and eight, there were some who hadn't mastered their multiplication tables by grade seven and eight. And what they found through this game and this sequence of lessons is that they were motivated to learn how to do their times tables so they could participate in this. Like they came and said, you know, I just don't know the multiplication tables. You know, I gave her a calculator just for to play the game. And then she started to come every day at noon to work on her times tables. So to increase her procedural fluency so that she could get these concepts. So that's just one. Um, You're stuck at the mic. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, I'm all, I have more comments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to speak, uh, share a personal example as well. Um, so my dad is from Trinidad, and his educational experience uh, growing up was also this kind of drill. Um, and so I grew up, and Saturday mornings were was all about doing math drills and using the math workbooks. And I had to memorize my times tables before I, you know, I even knew what numbers were for. And it was all memory work. And when I was in school. Um, 
I had a few teachers that also um, promoted that kind of rote memory. You know, they, they weren't really providing opportunities for us to actually like learn and understand and share that learning. But when I did get into classes where suddenly I, I found myself teaching other people and working in small groups, that for me, that was a, there was a real shift for me. And I needed to actually understand what it was that I was spending on Saturdays memorizing. And so as, as Bev said, I think it's important to have to have a, a balance of both. Um, but if we truly want to empower students, then we want them to be mechanics, I would say. Um, if we want them to see and use math um, as a tool and as a gatekeeper, as it is in so many, um, in so many ways, that it, it's more than just you know, the, the rote memory. It's about understanding and being able to use it as a tool to achieve. Yeah. Do they want to be mechanics, though? That's a well, question. We want them to see that there's value in being a mechanic, I guess, okay. yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to toss in a few words here, too. Um, mostly because I think this is, brings me back to some of the debates we even had in language, where do we teach everything with phonics or do we teach with whole language? And it was almost as if we had to be one or the other. And I think what you brought up is really what we find in mathematics, too. Do we teach all the skills or do we teach all the problem solving? And really, it's as others have suggested it. So we want to look at a balance of maybe three different ways. So one is about skills, and that's how you've identified it early, that there's some skill development that we need and understanding to help students have the basics for understanding uh, a number of ideas. We want to have a conceptual understanding so that we can see the concepts and build on the concepts. And then a, almost like a constructivist or inquiry perspective where we start to identify alternatives to solutions and we come up with maybe new ideas that we didn't have before because we've seen a new solution or a new idea or a new communication. So I think there's a balance of those three types of teaching and, and learning that need to take place. Thanks. Did you have another comment to that? Or? Oh, no. I was just going to ask if anyone's ever used a logbook for an exam. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up, we weren't allowed to use calculators to in exams. Oh, we had to yeah. use a logbook, and you don't know hell till you've had to use the logbook. It's like a torture device to figure out every single calculation. But what was great about the I logbook remember. is that it made me much better at mathematics than if I'd had a calculator. So I think in some sense, going back to these old Sorry, but what do you mean by mathematics there? What did you actually get better at? And just, um, I'd say my arithmetic skills got a lot better. It's just being able to compute in my head which, you know, which is a rare ability I find in these days, and that might be mm -hmm. because of um, increased use of calculators or something. But, you know, that's something, not not all of those things were bad. And that's my general comment. That's all. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And well, um, anybody else? Yes. Hi, I just wanted to make a comment on the previous analogy. I don't think it, I would prefer a different one. I would say that we should learn, uh, that we should think of mathematics as a language that we're learning so that not everybody is going to write the great Canadian novel, but everybody needs to have more of an understanding of how it works than just getting vocabulary, which is straight memory work. That's just my comment. Uh, yes, please. Hi, I'm Bruce. I have a question that goes in with Doug's uh, idea of a culture of mathematicians. Now, uh, there's a concept called an epistemic culture, and I'm just wondering if you can comment more on how our teaching might impose an epistemic culture, a set of norms, how mathematics and the techniques are sort of socially accepted within one group of mathematicians, and yet another group of mathematicians even say algebraists versus geometers, a different set of techniques would be considered appropriate. And I'm wondering if you can comment more on that and how our teaching imposes one or the other. I would love to answer that question. Um, but I might not answer it the way that you think, so feel free to repose it once I'm finished saying exactly what I want to say. Um, because I've been thinking about this since Doug was talking about worldviews, and I, I also um, participated in that Aboriginal Worldviews in Education course. It was great. Um, and I think that there's a strong connection between the idea of professional vision and the idea of worldview. So mathematics itself, if there is even one thing 
to call mathematics, which is, I think, part of your point, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it encapsulates a worldview. And this becomes most evident when we contrast it with a different worldview. Um, and the example that I have in mind is an Aboriginal example, which is why it came to mind um, when Doug was speaking. So um, a, a colleague of mine, Lisa Lenny Borden, she's an associate professor at uh, St. Francis Xavier University. Um, she's done a lot of collaborative work with Mi'kmaq communities in Eastern Canada. And she writes a lot about um, what she calls verbification of mathematics. So um, English and many uh, European languages are very noun-based, and mathematics in those languages is very noun-based. So the slope is so the slope is the rise over run. It's the x-intercept subtract the y-intercept. We have a lot of definitions of what things are. Many indigenous languages uh, here in North America are verb-based. And so you wouldn't really talk, you don't talk about things in the same way. And I'm speaking from a very superficial understanding, and I'm happy to be corrected. Um, but Lisa talks about the need to verbify mathematics in Mi'kmaq communities, because although many Mi'kmaq folks, um, they might speak Mi'kmaq, they might speak English, they might speak both, but the sort of variety of English that they speak is also still very verb-based. So instead of talking about the slope as a thing, you would talk about how the line moves, and it's a more dynamic concept. Or uh, Lisa talks a lot about working with geometry with kids and asking them to describe these shapes because she's an English speaker, she's non-Aboriginal, and so she can't immediately come up with a sort of verb-based way. And so you have a prism, a rectangular prism, which is like, um, like a box, right? And so we might define that as a six-sided figure with a set of right angles and parallel lines, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I actually don't know the definition. Someone can uh, speak up and tell us. Um, and so, but if she asks the children, then, um, you know, a rectangular prism is one that could sit on any side. So it, the act of sitting is important. Um, you talk about the face of a shape, and that's like where it looks out. It's not sort of just necessarily a thing. Or a, a, a pyramid is one that can't stand on its head. And so when she was working with the children to get their descriptions of mathematics, then it became, um, it became clear how the worldviews of a European-based mathematics, which has taken from many other cultures but sort of transmorphed it into a, a very European worldview, sees the world as static, sees uh, values definitions, um, and wants to sort of categorize and encode things and see them at one point in time, although the way that many mathematicians, even uh, Western ones, even talk about mathematics reveals that that's not all that they see, but encoded in the language is this idea of, of static things which is very different from the Aboriginal view, which is much more about how things move and how things are in relation to one another. And so, um, and so this professional vision or this worldview sort of evolves, and as others have said, it can make it more difficult for one person to sort of learn another kind of mathematics um, when they already know mathematics in one way that's very much aligned with their worldview, that it just it doesn't even make sense to talk about a thing, the slope of the line, when really aren't we talking about the way that the line moves when it goes from here to here? Um, so that's my answer to your question. And, uh, and I didn't continue. use the word epistemic even once, so. Okay. And I'm gonna continue that idea, but I'm gonna use it slightly different way. But I'm gonna use all the same words. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna use that either. I'm gonna, not gonna use it even once. Uh, I'm going to use it in a way that, because you're asking about geometry as an example, and we've got an example, and I'll start with that one. So if I was going to teach it the way I taught it as a beginning teacher, I taught it because geometry was taught to me, who was taught to the, my teacher, and on and on, that it was a static idea. I could use a compass and a protractor, and I can draw those things, and if you ever remember being in grade seven and having to draw circles with these compass and protractors, we couldn't do it, and we had to measure angles, and somebody said, add them up and it's, see what you get, and I got 178, and I tried it again, I got 183 and 185, and finally the teacher said, oh no, it's 180. Not once did I get 180. So I didn't think, along the entire process, 
that my understanding of geometry and the geometry of the teacher were the same. Now, it's really interesting that I continued on and did my doctorate in geometry, but it just, it was my way of saying, I don't think I understand this. But as we continue to learn about it, so as a teacher, I was giving out that, that geometry was static. You draw a picture, you measure it. You draw another one, you measure it. As I continued on as a teacher, though, I changed my view of how I wanted to teach it, and I started to use Geometer Sketchpad and now using other software, where geometry was no longer a compass and protractor, but it was a circle with a series of lines that could move. Back to the worldview we heard, now I started to think of geometry as dynamic. I could create a different world. I could measure that those three angles as many times as I wanted to. They still came up to 180. And all of a sudden, now I understood it is 180, no matter what I do. And so my view of thinking about geometry changed because of how I taught it. And so did it with my students. So you're asking, so how does a teacher really influence the teaching of mathematics? There are, I think, in every single topic now in mathematics, I can give an example where as we learned, it was static, and now we realize it's dynamic. And I think it now fits really closely to my new understanding of Aboriginal worldview, which is, um, as described by Inigo, I'm glad we both take the same, took the same course. This is our first time to really realize we both take it in that same course and have learned, what's that? 28,000. 28,000 other people, yes. But I think it's changed both of our views of how we take a look at the importance of worldview or professional vision in teaching. And I hope that we continue that growth. May I follow up with, with actually just that point? How much of that do you think was an influence of culture upon you, given a change of environment from an academic setting to a teaching setting? Uh, both of those happened as a teacher. Oh, okay. So those were... Both of those happened before I came here, before I entered uh, the, this kind of academic environment. It was me as a first and second and third year teacher to a, an eight or nine year teacher when I realized that all of those things that I was trying to do were static and mathematics to me was static. I knew, for example, what I was doing every day. I don't know how many of you know the old red book. I knew exactly what I was doing every single day and I wrote it down there and I knew what homework I had. 1 A C E, 2 A C E. And why? Because I saved the B D Fs for the tests that the students realized. And that was a pattern year after year. And the students got good at it. Those who were smart said, Oh, I should be doing the B D Fs because that's what's going to be on the test. And that's all I wanted them to do do more questions. And that was our pattern. So finally, I realized one thing that changed my view, and that is that mathematics was pattern and infinity. And when I finally realized that, I started to look at it as, what are the patterns? And if I continue that pattern long enough, it got to me to infinity. And that's why I started to change. So it didn't, didn't influence me here. It was as a teacher realizing I couldn't make a difference because my worldview or my view of mathematics was static because I was taught that way and my professors taught that way and as a child they taught that way and all of my colleagues were teaching that way. So it was a, it's, we all have chances to change as a teacher all the way through the process. I have more to say. Um, so yeah, it, it's not surprising given my view on professional vision and learning as always cultural and always in community. You have different communities of mathematicians that don't overlap that much. It makes a lot of sense that they're going to develop different ideas about what math is and how you do it. And then Doug also made this beautiful point uh, that communities change too. I mean, communities are not static. They're always interacting with other communities, but also changing from within. And so it, it makes sense. That, that that would happen as well, that the, the teaching community has changed over time, and Doug was a part of, of that change, of both making the change and learning from others who were making those changes. Great question, you see. It's just stimulated so much response. Um, I'd just like to highlight um, one of those changes in community within a teacher's practice. And so this was in the Math for Young Children project. Remember I said I wanted to try and fit this example in? <laughs> I'm going to slide it in here, and it has to do with geometry and moving from static to a more transformational approach. Um, but the group of teachers that I was part of was part of this lesson study project where they were collaborating, and they took a, they developed a culture of inquiry into their practice. That's, that's really what it's about. They're looking at what children bring to mathematics, what kind of current research is done in, in that area. They're looking at a specific strand. So in this case, it was geometry, and it was in a grade one classroom. 
And so looking at current research, um, designing activities that would be kind of like clinical interviews so they could work one-on-one -on -one with children to find out what children actually knew about that concept, and then designing some exploratory lessons that would um, allow them to move the children's thinking forward or just to find out more about this, this topic. And so um, in this particular example, so we'd done a lot of clinical interviews, done the exploratory lessons, and then we asked the grade one the teacher asked the grade one or invited the grade one children to, with four cubes, four interlocking cubes, how many different combinations could you come up with or how many different arrangements that could you come up with that would be different than each other's? And so in doing that, the children started to um, come across ideas of congruence and, you know, they were flipping and turning and seeing if they were the same. And uh, so already t in this lesson study group, teachers admitted that in the past they had only taught geometry by having children name the, sh name the shapes, label the sides, blah, 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 in that kind of way. And so already they started to do something different. But even in this, even in changing the math, when we think about math as being um, a way to participate, there were people that were excluded from this. And so what happened is that the teacher noticed that some of the English language learners in her class, and this was at Thorncliffe Public School, which is the largest elementary school in Canada. Um, uh, anyway, she, she, and so it's a multilingual, multicultural school. She noticed that um, a group of English language learners didn't seem to be participating, and she thought they were quiet and shy and didn't know, you know what the flips and the turns were. And so it, as luck would have it, one of um, my graduate students was with me that day, and who could, and she could speak Urdu. And so I said um, to the classroom teacher, would it be okay if, if we spoke Urdu to the children? And so the children right away, their faces lit up, and they, um, and so what happened is the researcher, Sarah Nakvi, was able to talk to them and ask them, you know, how can you make this shape go like the other ones? So she was also kind of verbifying math with them. What can you do to this one to make it look the same as this one? And so very quickly the children were doing that. And when we asked them to explain their thinking at first, they were quiet. And then when we said, you know, what's going on in that brain of yours? I said that in English. And I said, and please explain in Urdu. And they were excited and animatedly described things. And they used a combination of Urdu and English. They would speak in Urdu and then they would say, flip, da -da 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 -da, turn. And so they were doing this kind of code switching. And for that, at that moment, that for the teacher, that was an aha moment. She realized that she had painted those children as quiet, shy, and not knowing. She had done just through observation. And it highlighted for her the fact that we, we can't know everything simply by observing, but by having children languaging, uh, that helped explain, you know, it helped assess where they were and helped then move them into this trajectory. That's just one little example. Oh, that's a great example, actually. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good question, yes. Jim. I, I really love this, this notion of, um, of worldview and, and, and teaching mathematics by being aware of the worldview and, and tailoring what you're doing so that the people can understand. So the verbifying example, that was really nice. The thing that confuses me, though, and you, you used it when you talked about this notion of Western mathematics. You know, are we talking about just one field of mathematics, but presenting it in a way that people with their worldviews can understand it? Or are, we, are you suggesting that there are actually different mathematics out there? Like there's a Western mathematics, an Eastern mathematics, an Indigenous mathematics that are different from one another, fundamentally different. <laughs> Uh, so everyone can answer, but, but for me, I think depending on what you mean by the same or different, which came up in Bev's in kind of a mathematical way, um, yes, there are many different mathematics and, and no, there's just one. Um, so I think for all intents and purposes, there are many different mathematics because of what our friend said about different sort of standards for, for truth or acceptability or different methods um, that are accepted or not accepted, different ways of thinking about the same thing. And so, you know, if those are different enough, we might call them different. Um, could we think about them as all part of the same thing? Yes, I think we could too. So 
Uh, it's sort of a weaselly way of not answering your question, but I honestly think it depends really what you're what you mean by different. Yeah, and it may depend on what type of community we're talking about, because certainly there are communities perhaps that have their own type of mathematics, it's perhaps very situational. But I, I can imagine too, if you went to any university in the world, anywhere, in any country, and asked them about the people they hire to be mathematicians there, they're all going to be hiring pretty much the same kinds of people. There's nobody who's going to be looking for someone who's an expert in indigenous mathematics. You know, um, they're going to be looking for what we're calling Western mathem mathematicians, probably. But on the other hand, there are local communities, you know, that, as you say, uh, seek truth in different ways. Maybe but Jim, oh. I was wondering, are you talking about to, um, are you thinking about like a math as a kind of universal thing? Um, because that was that's a, a popular notion, this idea that there is something, there is a universal mathematics, sort of like a platonic ideal of math. And um, so, I mean, I, w I wasn't sure if that was part of what you were getting at, but it was one of those questions that kind of comes up, and I don't know if you want to tackle that. Sorry, I just want, I have a question. Is it language, maybe? Like, I'm thinking about universal math. I'm thinking about maybe it's not so much math, being all the same, but as much as the way that we express math in one language, um, it being different languages have different connotations, different ways of approaching um, math. Like, for instance, in Bev's class, we watched this video of, uh, um, I forget what her name is, but she was explaining that in, and I think it was Cantonese or Mandarin, uh, the number sense that's involved in the language and understanding it, um, that isn't in English. It's somewhat in French, but it's not in English. Um, but understanding tens and the quantity of ten and having the number sense of that and the way in which we express it in English doesn't come across the same way in different languages. Can, can so, I just jump in? So yeah. for those who aren't familiar, so in some languages, the way to say 63 is to say something like six tens and three. Yeah. And in English, that's, that's not there. Yeah, and sorry, so in this video that Bev showed us, this uh, student was saying she did this translation in her head when she got to, to learning English and doing math in English. And she had to translate it back into her native language, which was Cantonese or Mandarin, and uh, then had to express it in English to everybody else because her mind had done the number sense and it made so much more sense in this other language. But the way in which she was told she had to express it in the classroom was in English. So I'm wondering if, to answer your question, that maybe it's more that the dominant language right now in like the world is English and the way in which we look at things in a lot of ways is English. So, you know, the fact that that is our dominant language, it could be part of the reason why there's so much contention. Sorry. I think that's great. And I would just, um, in the language that I use, um, I would more talk about different kinds of practices because I have a, an emphasis on what people do. And so people do different kinds of things and call it math. And so I'll call those different math. And it could also be, uh, Jim, back to the comment about what we've heard a little bit here, is that it's something to do with the focus or the, the purpose of mathematics and why we're doing it. So what earlier we heard a little bit was that the focus was on skills and trying to make sure that the students understood skills. So that would have a different teaching component to it, would have different teaching approaches because that's the goal of teaching in mathematics. In other places, the goal might be to focus on problem solving skills and so that would then lead to a completely different perspective on the importance of mathematics, how to teach it, what order to teach it, the, the, whether there are strands of mathematics or if there are um, more like big ideas in mathematics. So it wouldn't necessarily be that there are different mathematics, it's just what is the purpose of it, what are we doing it for and how are we going to get to that point point? and we hear that probably in all the different countries. Um, whether large classes, small classes, etc. I've got lots of stories to tell, but... Okay, I have a question. This question is uh, related to mathematics culture itself. So, right now, language actually influences our culture. English influences you know, English Western world and the culture, and the Chinese language influences Chinese culture. Culture influences our behavior, mm -hmm. you know? Right now, mathematics, you will accept that, Mathematics is a global language. Mathematics as a global language, mathematics is rigorous. That is one thing. Another is precise. Another is strict, also serious. This is a mathematics characteristics. 
So in this situation, when we in educational system, we try to help students creativity, develop creativity. But in creativity, the, some students, they try to guess some information, especially some formulas. When two fraction eight together, they numerous plus numerous. And the, the how to say, this is the denominator plus demerits. You guys, this is not very strict, not very rigor. So in this situation, as a teacher, how do you help your students and the teachers and change their behavior in class, in the, their thinking? Can I just rephrase the question to make sure yeah. that I understand it? So uh, you said a few things. You said that mathematics is uh, rigorous and strict. Um, and, and also serious. And serious? Precise, yes. Precise. Yeah. Um, and you said that currently um, there's an emphasis on students being creative and sort of inventing their own mathematical algorithms. And sometimes when they are creative, they do things that are incorrect, yeah, such as adding fractions incorrectly by adding the, the numerators and or adding the denominators. And you want to know what we might do in such a situation? Is that the question? So we should change the student and the teacher's behavior. This behavior is wrong, you know. You just guess something, but you guys is not very, very rigorous, right? So how should we change teacher and the student's behavior? This is also mathematics culture. So you're saying teachers shouldn't ask students to do that kind of thing? So us uh, and the faculty of education and the care, we should help our pre-service teachers, in-service teachers change their behavior. Do not always guide some, some formulas. Do not always give the formulas? I think you said not guess. Not guess. Not guess, not guess yeah. the formulas. Yeah, not guess formulas. How can we get teachers to not ask students to invent their own math? What do you mean? You went to uh, and I so you're saying uh, teachers need to change their behavior. They are you saying they should not ask students to guess, to guess a formula? Formulas. Yes. And that how can we get teachers to stop doing that? Yes, that is my question. So just to clarify, um, so you would like teachers to be able to almost give the formula to the students? Is that what you mean? But in a way, you want to know how to do that. I mean, the teachers, they should help a student when they use right. formulas, their formula should be correct. Right, OK. They should not guess. Some so formulas. I think that we're coming back to the idea of how to link conceptual understanding with procedural fluency. And so there are many ways of um, sh showing people what it means, what what uh, two thirds actually means, and not just using the pie, the pie because the pie. If you're if teachers are relying only on the pie shape to do fractions, children uh, incorporate that into their schema for solving problems, and so what happens there is that they then think that three quarters and two thirds is the same because there's one piece of the pie missing. Do you get it? So in a three-quarters, you know when you shade it, and there's one not shaded, and two-thirds, you shade them, and one's not? If you ask a student which is larger, two-thirds or three-quarters, they'll say it's the same. And so we need to find multiple representations of fractions, multiple opportunities for children to experience what it actually means. So using rectangles, using crackers, using fraction bars, things that um, really spark students' proportional reasoning. To, for the, so that they do develop an understanding of what fractions mean so that they can then do the algorithm, the standard formula. They know why it's important to change one-sixth or two-sixths to one-third if you're adding one-third or adding something with the denominator of a third because they, they, there are wonderful ways to show equivalent fractions without just giving the rule and having them do a lot of worksheets. Over to you, Doug. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to make a, another comment on this as well. I think the, what Helen, you described is one perspective or one worldview on mathematics in that mathematics is strict and it's serious and rigorous and there is only one or two ways to do everything. And I think what we've learned is that there are a variety of perspectives of the learning of mathematics and that while you've described one, I'm going to describe another one that there isn't only one way to do mathematics and that exploration of mathematical concepts is a value in itself. 
and that we don't want just to get students to go to the answer. We want to actually have a struggle to, to learn along the way. And so for me, one of my big learnings was I want to find ways of giving activities to students so that I can identify their misconceptions so I can start to work on it. So I'm actually looking for them to make errors so I can expose their thinking. If I only worked with, here's one way to do it, learn it, I have no way of really identifying what that error, what the errors might be or what might happen if I change one number. So I'm working with one half plus one quarter and I continue with one third and one sixth and I have one fifth and one tenth and one tenth and one twentieth and I do that over and over again. And until I start changing the numbers, do I really get an understanding of their thinking? The second reason why I might like the idea of different alternatives is that if I give one, vo one view of how to learn mathematics, that doesn't give me a chance to find out what other students know. So recently I learned that if I'm subtracting two numbers, even small numbers, like 53 subtract 40, a little bit small, minus 39, for example, I have one algorithm that I learned in North America. I learned, I grew up 20, 120 kilometers from here. I taught another 120 kilometers the other direction for many years. It was only when I started to learn and open up my ideas that there were maybe other ways that I heard how students in Germany and Eastern Europe, that they have a different way of thinking about subtraction. And they don't have this idea of regrouping. They actually use something that thinks further than that that takes me into all of algebraic conceptions. And I used to think I knew lots because it would just, you know, borrow this and carry this and all that. That's not how we learn in other places. And their other ideas were better than my ideas. So another reason why we want alternative explanations and, all, and algorithms is so that we can invite more cultures and more uh, students into the learning community that we talked about as a culture. So I think that's, it's good that we have different worldviews because we can talk about those things. And that's what you brought up. Thank you. Um, and just to quickly add, um, so we have this culture of, of success in mathematics that there is only one correct answer. And so I think that by having the alternatives, we help to open this up a little bit more and so that students can see that it's not just this one solution that they're trying to get to, but that there's multiple ways oftentimes to get there. And for teachers to celebrate and promote that kind of thinking as opposed to just getting to this one right answer might provide a context that's more inclusive to involve more <laughs> learners into the, into the experience. I just want to ask a question about teachers and teacher preparation. When I was growing up uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, all my teachers starting uh, grade five who were teaching math, they actually had a degree that was in math. It was, uh, it was a math pedagogy degree where they, they've seen a lot of math uh, up to calculus and uh, beyond. So they were able, and I never believed that uh, there was only one answer. Now, maybe there is one answer, but there are multiple ways of doing it, and there are different ways you can interpret the answer. That's what they were teaching us. Uh, so, and, and I have a feeling that uh, a lot of uh, teachers in North America, maybe some other places, uh, they, what kind of preparations do they have to have to, ha uh, to I have a feeling they need more of a pedagogy and more content. You know, should we, is it true that uh, uh, that uh, you know you need experts to teach math, or is there a combination? Or, can Can I just uh, ask it? Was it actually was there a degree in in math pedagogy? So it wasn't yeah. just math. So to math teach as a from subject, uh, to thing. teach from five to eight, what you did is you had a three year post secondary degree, right? Where you did both. You took psychology and uh, you know. Uh, in and math, math and all that stuff, and oh. then you had one year practicum. But you you oh. knew math uh, up to maybe second year of university. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to start an argument here. So, um, <laughs> come on, let's go. Um, uh, no, I don't think that math teachers need to know more math. I think they need to know more about social justice and about students and what culture is and what it is not because schools right now are reproducing inequality and they are making the same people succeed as have always succeeded 
and they're making a whole bunch of people fail. And not only that, they're sort of, they're making us believe that this is the way that it should be. And I would rather have a teacher who knows very little math, but knows something about structures of inequality in the world and how to work with students to help them become learners and to just to make connections between um, the bad things that schools do and sort of the rest of the world. I would rather have that in a teacher than someone that knows all the math that has ever been invented. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jim. <laughs> okay, uh, no, I want to argue that a little bit. I, th I mean, I think it's wonderful <laughs> that, teachers, that teachers have a sense of, you know, want to promote social justice issues. But I think that there's a huge problem. I mean, what you, you mentioned about... Um, about uh, teachers promoting this notion of one right answer, you know, that's because they don't understand enough mathematics. You know, mathematicians don't believe that. Mathemat mathematicians have all sorts of different ways of getting proofs for the, the same problem. You know, the problem is not enough deep knowledge of mathematics. That's what's causing the problems in the schools. Uh, not, and, and just watering it down further means that our students will have even less understanding of what, what math is all about. I think if a mathematician was teaching grade two math, it's unlikely that they would actually consider that there are so many different ways to do it and let's see what you think. And I, I think there are some people who do that. There are a lot of people who don't. But that's and because it's a tradition of the school, not because it's a tradition of, mathemat of mathematicians. It's, just, it's the school culture that's promoting that. I've spoken to a lot of mathematicians that have this idea that um, you need the basics before you can go and do what they think is the real math which is what they do. And so they want to drill the basics into kids so that eventually at some point later they will love mathematics so much that they will want to write proofs. And I just don't see a lot of evidence that that's going to be successful. So yeah, I mean, there are different mathematicians just as they're, you know, different people are different from each other. I think for the most part, I wouldn't trust most mathematicians to go into an urban school and, and do anything positive. I'm, 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 I'm not. I'm not. This is about to go on the internet, so I need some people to have my back. I don't. I don't want mathematicians to go in schools either. I want teachers to go into schools who know more mathematics. I mean, of course, pedagogy should go first. I mean, I think I, I do think that there has been a confounding though in this discussion between the culture of mathematics, which is different from the culture of school mathematics. You know, and the culture of school mathematics is problematic, and I can I can agree with all of you on that. Just, uh, I am. Just, Why not? Oh, can I just respond to Jim? And I'm going to respond to Jim and Indigo, who are both on my committee. So <laughs> you can see I'm going to do it in a balanced way. Um, just that, Jim. Yes, I think that you are right that we do have to develop some more content. Uh, knowledge in teachers and so that's what we've been doing in the math for young children project where the teachers are actually working with university researchers and they're developing their content they're doing math they're so they're learning about the different strands of math that being said in the classroom there are still cases where inequities are being promoted. And, you know, luckily in, in the case of the students speaking Urdu, we had a group, you know, that was kind of aware of really wanting to draw on children's linguistic knowledge and bring it to the forefront. So they had someone who was equity-based on their team, me, who was able to provide research from Judith Moscovich, who really talked about the importance of letting children or providing opportunities for children to think mathematically in their first language and to explain their mathematical thinking in their first language. If I hadn't been on that team, you know, there likely would have been still those, those girls who are shy and quiet. Blah, 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 blah. So there we had a place where we were developing math content knowledge, but at the same time we were developing an awareness of inequities in society and promoting that. So I really feel like they need to be hand in hand. To, to provide a really good learning environment for children. Uh, it seems to me that all the tension in this room, the good, good tension, good, well-intended tension, seems to be rising from the fact that we're trying to impose uh, our views of pedagogy, which is usually subjective, on something that is essentially objective, which is Mathematics, as in that 
pi is always pi, 3.14, the value of pi is always pi. I mean, some of, some of the people on the panel seem to contend that all of you do admit that there is one answer, but there's multiple ways of getting at it, right? And from what I understand, there, the, there, if there is one answer, that is the answer, essence of objectivism or positivism. While we're talking about subjective ways of teaching. So is it, are there multiple, are we actually sitting here and saying that there are multiple answers in mathematics? Or are we saying there's one answer, but there's different ways of getting at it? Because those are different things. I, I think there are different things because I don't see that there's only one answer. I think there are many different questions that have many different answers. So for example, if I asked you to identify as many uh, rectangles that have integer sides where the perimeter is 12, then the answer is not just one answer. There are somewhere between three and five, depending on how you define the rest of rectangles. So I think there are many ways, and we want to have many ways, where there's more than one answer, because it allows us to get a variety of thinking methods and alternatives. But I want to go back to Jim's just for a minute, and then I'll come, and we'll go back to yours. I don't want to leave yours yet. Um, because I, I'm not completely sold on there, that there's only one thing that we need to know, or more than one thing. I, I mean, more in one side, for example, we need to know only social justice, for example. For me, I think that there's three or four areas that need to come together in a certain way to make a good teacher. So they need to have content knowledge, because in order to have that content knowledge, you then can build your pedagogical content knowledge, because then you'll know at which point a student may or may not understand something, because you know that that looks like a misconception to you. You also want to build on top of that some technological understanding so that you can build in visual mathematics. You can bring in new ways to represent the dynamic view of mathematics. And then on top of that, you want to be able to use social justice issues and be able to recognize, here is a good time for me to intervene in this engagement of discussion in classroom to say, I can take this point that we have now and I can illustrate an inequity or I can illustrate um, an injustice that's happening. Without having that content, you wouldn't really know the right context or the right type of questions to ask, the right kinds of activities to be doing to get at those issues. And it's particularly true in some of the work that I did with grade seven and eight, where we actually taught problem solving from a social justice view but we use context as a way of getting at it. The inequities that happen because of the numbers we knew or the situations that we knew. So coming back, I think, to the question you had, is there one answer? If we take the perspective that teachers have this content and pedagogical content knowledge, and we use the context that allows them to get at these issues, then you don't want just one answer because it's the multitude of answers and ways of getting at it that allow you to explore the issues. Social justice is not one answer. It is many contexts and many ways to think about it. And so if, if we think of math as one answer, we won't get to them. But I think... I and mathematics isn't one answer either. I want to I wanna add to that. So uh, if you think about geometries, in some geometries, parallel lines never meet. In other geometries, parallel lines always meet. Um, and then if you think about even just basic arithmetic, um, in ethnomathematics, there's this old story, which is probably not true, um, and it has a very colonial mindset, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, so there's some anthropologist guy, and he goes to this sheep herder, and uh, he wants to trade blankets for sheep or something. And he's like, okay, well, let's negotiate. You have these two sheep. I want these sheep. How many blankets? Okay, five. I don't know, making that. Um, okay, and so they agree, five blankets for these two sheep. And then the anthropologist is like, well, no, actually, I want four sheep. So here I'm going to give you 10 blankets. And then the story goes, um, you know, then the sheep herder says, no, that's not worth 10. Uh, from one perspective, you know, you just double both. Of course, what could be simpler? Um, from the perspective of the sheep herder, like, no, these are not equivalent sheep. Uh, it was these two sheep and those five blankets. You want these other two sheep? No way. Maybe I don't even want to give you four. Maybe one of them's, you know, a baby or something, or one's more valuable. So those, you know, they're both sort of right by their own assumptions. Mathematics is always built on a set of values and assumptions, and we mathematize the world. We make different assumptions. We're going to come up with different answers. 
but that's values, uh, that's placing values on something and you're talking about bartering. Uh, is that necessarily, I, I guess what I'm saying, I think uh, might be maybe this was what Jim was saying, if I can put words in his mouth, if you let me, is that if, if those, that problem that you gave me, Doug, which I understood nothing about, could you just repeat that, that multiple rectangular thing? Is that if someone got the same problem, I guess what I'm saying is someone got the same problem in Nigeria and someone got the same problem in Bangladesh and they came up with two different sets of answers, are we going to sit here and say that they're both equally valid? Uh, they probably will come up with different sets of, because you have to really understand the definition of a rectangle to get to it and whether a square is a rectangle. But what I mean is that there are <laughs> at least three different shapes that give you the answer of 12. So if we change the ideas of mathematics to rather than saying here's a problem give me the answer if we give them the answer and some of the problem then there may be different ways diff there may be a number of different possible answers that could get you to that answer or, or get you to that situation. And and in my example of bartering I mean it's yes it's bartering but it's also what does two actually mean? What does four mean? Was that four sheep or was that you know, this set of each individual sheep, and it depends on the context. The mathematical answer you get depends on the set of assumptions that you make. If we all make the same assumptions about what's true, we'll all probably come to the same agreement about an answer or what kinds of answers are acceptable. But very often, we're making different kinds of assumptions in different mathematics. So, but, so is the purpose of mathematics any longer to generalize, or are we is to provide that level of abstraction in the world so that we can perform these computations, or are we taking that away from mathematics? And what do we still call that mathematics after that? For some mathematics, that's a goal. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've actually only got time for one more question, so who wants to? Yes. Come, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, come on, Monique. Yeah, no, you... <laughs> Um, no, I just wanted to uh, sort of pick up on the discussion, which I think is really interesting. And um, I, I guess I speak from different hats, teacher, math, stats, um, instructor here, now, researcher, all these kinds of stuff. And I just want you to say, dare I say interaction? Like what I'm hearing are sort of all these different sort of complexities and things that play into sort of how culture matters. And sort of got triggered by sort of what Indigo said about, I don't know if I would I, I, let me, I hope I, I didn't get this right, but the idea of a mathematician going into an urban school and sort of you trusting sort of what would happen then around the issues of social justice. That's where I think sort of I ended up going, getting a little bit of a disconnect about what was happening because we were talking about the teacher and the pedagogy and sort of a deep understanding. And then we we're talking about the fact that maybe they don't need that deep understanding, but yet we're saying they do. And what I'm trying to get at is has there been any work, because I really don't know the area, around um, the interaction of all these things? And then what exactly is it that we're trying to isolate by looking at all these different things? Because I definitely am originally from Barbados, so I definitely had the, the sort of drill and kill and so on and so forth, which I hated because I always had the longing for, so what? Um, and I did math until undergrad where it became no longer numbers but letters. And uh, I thought, okay, this is getting way too far for me now. Um, so a lot of my stuff I do is applied. And one of the things that is concerning is that would I be seen as somebody who perhaps might be sort of fitting a particular um, box and therefore I'm not worthy of walking into a particular type of a classroom or setting because perhaps I don't have the know-how about how to infuse certain things into my teaching or my class. And the question is, is this about math or is this about sort of the communities that we're creating in our classrooms? So that's sort of, sort of what came to mind for me in a sort of a nutshell. Throwing that out there. <laughs> uh I feel, although I was happy to just be, you know, the person who makes this outrageous statement, I'm going to qualify it a little bit. Um, and, and what I really think is that I think that a teacher with a strong understanding of social justice and equity issues and students who's teaching math is more likely to recognize that they need to know math and might, you know, go about some steps of trying to learn some math enough to be able to teach it. Whereas someone who's very, very strong in math might not actually recognize that there's a huge gap in their understanding 
and they're less likely to go and pursue that very essential knowledge. So I apologize for sounding more measured and balanced um, <laughs> than I did before. Um, I, I'll just quickly add to that that the content and the understanding of the mathematics itself is tremendously important, but I think it's just as important for the teacher to understand the lived experiences of the students, and that sort of ties back to what Bev talked about initially about making it culturally relevant, and so I think that that's just as important um, in terms of the teaching as the mastering of the content, if you will. Okay, well, we're out of time, so um, I want to... Um, have you all join me in a big round of applause for our panelists. And also to Cheryl Clark, who did all the publicity for this and set up. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, and I think we should try and have more of these next year. I don't know, we have to think of new things to argue about, but it seems to me we just start to get going at these with these. We did it in the technology and the science one and now the math one. So maybe we could have a level two that got deeper and we could think of better titles. So thank you. And if we can take a moment to thank Claire for sharing this uh, session and to keeping your time. Thank you.